Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Melville Douglas um, Focus on ESG um, webinar. In, it is August, which is Women's Month, so as we did last um, year, we have, are hosting an all-female panel to um, discuss um, our ESG focus, and we're really excited to introduce our new ESG officer, Bali Makatini. Um, I th I'm pretty sure when we um, did this last month in August, we really thought that we'd be able to see you in person this time, um, but unfortunately, I think we're going to have to wait until next year for that one. Um, the second panelist is Pundana Naidu. She's the co-manager on our award-winning um, Melville Douglas Global Equity Fund, and she'll be taking us through um, three examples of companies that we own in the fund that have an ESG focus. On a more personal note, um, when I joined Melville Douglas 15 years ago, um, I was pregnant with my um, nearly 15-year-old um, son, and the firm had just just celebrated, a bit, had a big party, which I missed, um, that it had gone through the 10 billion rand um, mark for assets under management. We have grown a lot since then. Um, that amount is now over around about 76 billion rand. Um, and some of that has been through, through the core Melville Douglas business growing, but we've also added the diversified business. And I think you'll remember that last year we had um, Natalie van Royen, who, who runs that business um, in, in our panel, and stockbroking, and a very vibrant offshore business. So over that time, um, the team has grown quite a lot, and we're just going to put up a slide to show you, because I think one of the things that has changed in the team from when I started is that it's certainly a lot more diverse than it was before. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to mention is just that it's really, you know, we we have got a very good um, representation of um, women in our Melville Douglas team, and it's really not not possible to increase your participation of females in the workplace unless you provide a little bit of flexibility. I think that's really important because. Um, women in the workplace are trying to do two very important jobs at the same time. One, they're, they're trying to be a mother, and two, they're trying to do their day job. Um, so I think that that is certainly um, something that we're proud of, that we do provide that environment that suits um, our, our female staff. One of the other things that I, you know, that I think has changed quite a lot is that a lot of those people are also actually juggling homeschooling. So fortunately, my children are a bit older than that, but there are people who are I really feel for who have the stress on top of their job of having to actually teach their sort of five, six-year-olds writing and arithmetic. And I think that would be more stressful than your day job. Um, I think it's important to always stress that in terms of um, the Melville Douglas investment philosophy, this ESG is really part of something that we've always really done. We focused on buying superior businesses that offer better risk-adjusted returns. Um, we long-term investors, so the sustainability of the businesses we invest in has always been something we consider. But I think with all that's been happening in the world, whether it's COVID, between climate events, and more recently in South Africa, some social unrest as well, um, it's increasingly clear that companies with a good ESG framework are less risky in investments and they're better positioned to thrive in an uncertain future. So we're going to move on to Mbali now, and Mbali is going to take us through what Melville Douglas does um, in terms of its pro ESG processes and how it works with our investment philosophy. Over to you, Mbali. Thank you so much, Izin, for the great introduction. Um, and yes, I'm equally excited not only to be presenting on ESG today, but to have joined the Melville Douglas family. Um, I think I'm a month in now, so it's been quite interesting. Uh, but I suppose before I start, um, it's probably important to note that Melville Douglas has an ESG process in place, and it takes ESG principles very seriously, um, hence my appointment to, to redefine our ESG strategy and setting new goals and targets for ourselves. Um, ESG is a critical part of our investment process as it accounts for the non-financial risks um, in our assets under management. And an event like COVID, um, it's really enforced and reminded us that these non-financial risks are extremely material. Um, the pandemic has taught us many great lessons 
I suppose, for example, um, we saw how having sound uh, social policies pertaining to issues such as um, occupational health and safety, uh, maybe disaster management, employee health benefits, or business continuity um, really helped in building resilience in companies. In fact, um, uh, it was, I think, Morningstar that reported that ESG funds were more resilient and outperformed their counterparts last year because the companies um, with rigorous ESG principles were in a better position to adapt um, to the changes resulting from the pandemic. Um, I, I believe it was Warren Buffett who said, uh, when the tide goes out, um, do we discover who's been swimming naked? And this was um, a very tough reality that we saw where companies that were operating without ESG aligned processes and policies were, were very much exposed. And I suppose as an asset manager, it's critical for us to have a view of the uh, the level of exposure of the assets that um, don't have these risk management frameworks in place because it enables us to make better investment decisions. So, so what is ESG? I think that's where I'm really going to start and maybe just take a step back for those who might need a little bit of clarity on what exactly ESG is. The acronym obviously stands for Environment, Social and Governance, um, and in the case of environment, uh, one would investigate how companies operate, um, either um, dependent or inversely impact nat the natural environment. This could relate to issues such as climate change, uh, air and water pollution. Uh, perhaps a good example here would be climate change, as, as it's such a, a prevalent and topical issue. Uh, climate change risks are separated into uh, two main buckets, being physical risk and transitional risk. Where your physical risk uh, really relates to elements like your extreme weather events, increased temperature, uh, flooding as an example, droughts, um, etc. And then you also have your transitional risks, um, which include uh, issues such as policies and, and, and regulatory changes, as well as societal expectations and market pressures uh, to move towards a more sustainable economy or sustainable practices. So this could um, you know, be the promulgation of ESG-related regulations, uh, the requirements to pay carbon tax is a simple one that we've experienced locally. Uh, so an asset manager would, you know, would need to understand these risks and where um, the exposure sits in a given portfolio. So for example, if you know, um, you would, one could look at how does temperature impact, um, Im impact agriculture stocks or water scarcity affects a sector's highly dependent on water um, or what uh, carbon tax means financially for carbon intense industries. I mean, the, the list goes on and um, underst even understanding how regulation and global pressures to divest from fossil fuels could potentially result in stranded assets over time in our portfolios. And then moving on to the social issues, um, you know, social aspects are investigated. Um, these could be occupational health and safety, labor standards, or human rights. Uh, these are critical in sectors such as mining or palm oil, for example, uh, where we know challenges such as child and forced labor are quite prevalent in the supply chain. So if companies have ESG aligned processes in place, these material risks would be identified, they would be mapped, and then they would um, be managed accordingly. I mentioned palm oil as an example. Um, in this instance, a fund manager could potentially use um, sustainable palm oil certification as a requirement for investments um, in that fund that he or she is managing, or maybe look at compliance with international best practice standards relating to the sector. Um, you know, so what 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 does this really mean in terms of uh, you know providing assurance and sorry and what this really means is that it provides us with assurance that um, these risks have been accounted for and have sufficiently been managed. And then moving on to governance, um, here I think you know the elements that you see there that could pertain to um, issues such as uh, diversity in board in the board. Um, bribery and corruption, gender equality, and shareholder rights. And I think governance is really important because um, if you have your governance structures in place, this really holds everything together to ensure that you have a, a system that's working appropriately. So we now know what ESG is, um, but how does Melville Douglas integrate ESG investment approach? Um, I can say that Melville Douglas comfortably um, covers the approaches from, you know, screening all the way up to impact investing. Um, 
maybe an important way to look at this diagram is how ESG investments um, approaches or, or sustainable approaches have evolved over time with conventional investing uh, being the most basic, progressing all the way up to impact investing. As you can see on the slide, conventional investing is, is you know, quite basic. It's your limited uh, or no focus to ESG um, in, um, issues or factors. And then you move on to your screening. Uh, this could be negative or exclusionary screening, uh, best or, uh, or positive screening and non-space screening. Um, I think a, a good example of this that we are quite familiar with is where um, organizations have um, exclusion to certain controversial sectors, for example, um, thermal coal, we've discussed that in the climate change um, uh, section, it could be arms and ammunition where we purely don't invest in that space or we have set ourselves maybe portfolio um, thresholds within um, our investments uh, portfolio to say we're not going to invest beyond that specific um, percentage of, of our investment universal portfolio. And then the next stage is ESG integration. And I think we fare quite well here. And we have uh, several processes in place. Um, we have an ESG assessment and scoring process. And this is really a combination of um, a sector specific materiality assessment in line with the sustainability, um, sorry, a sustainable accounting board, a standards board. And we also get uh, research and reports uh, by an external accredited service provider. And what this research provides us with is ESG performance, uh, an ESG performance overview, sorry, of um, the listed equities and a respective score that speaks to that performance. We also have impact assessments um, and scoring uh, processes. And this is quite similar to the ESG assessments that I was speaking about. Um, but here we, in addition to that, the, the ESG issues, we look at how, um, you know, certain stocks will contribute towards sustainable development goals. Um, SDGs or the Sustainable Development Goals are a set um, of goals um, that were developed by the, uh, the United Nations Assembly, providing a blueprint to achieve a better and sustainable future. So, although we take, you know, um, ESG scores into account, we're quite mindful that ESG matters are multifaceted. So we don't, so we consider, so we don't just consider the score. We also consider the contextual. Uh, operating environment and we actively engage management of our investments to get a full picture of the ESG, the true ESG uh, uh, performance, I should put it that way, before making a decision. And then lastly, in terms of ESG integration, um, we also have a process and a platform in place that allows us to vote our proxies, uh, which is a great way for us to be able to influence ESG elements of our domestic and global equity holdings. For example, we vote around issues such as climate change, uh, disclosure, gender equality, and uh, uh, board diversity. And then the last um, you know, approach that you see on the slide there is the impact investing. Um, and that speaks to you know, investments that are made with the intention of generating positive and more importantly, measurable um, societal or environmental impacts alongside those financial returns. So then uh, we've discussed the what and the how in terms of SDG, uh, SD, sorry, ESG. Um, so now it's probably quite pertinent to cover why ESG, why do we use this and why it's important. Um, I've explained how the ESG strategy provides a rigorous risk management uh, framework for asset managers. And in fact, the World um, Economic Forum uh, publishes a global risk report every year. And in 2021, the top five risks by likelihood were um, extreme weather, climate um, action failure, human and environmental damage, infectious diseases, and biodiversity. And then they also ranked um, the top five risks in terms of impact being infectious diseases, uh, climate action failure, weapons of mass destruction, biodiversity loss, and natural resource crises. So, I mean, it's quite evident that these risks all speak to issues of ESG. Um, so having an ESG due diligence process in all of our investments enables us to manage these risks uh, through the respects of policies and frameworks. But it doesn't um, only do this, it, it gives us um, sites of emerging opportunities, um, giving us a competitive advantage. So you'll see I've separated in the slide um, our, assets under and our assets under management into two buckets. 
um, one being all our investments, which are subject to our ESG due diligence process, and then the second being um, the sustainable investments, which have, um, I suppose, stricter and more niche requirements in terms of eligibility criteria. And we really believe that having an ESG strategy instills rigor to our investment processes, and it also provides transparency to our investors on how we are managing their money effectively. I mentioned the sustainable development goals, and I thought I'd probably just highlight those um, for, for those that aren't too familiar. Um, again, these were developed by the United Nations Assembly. So um, I, I suppose you may have seen countries committing to these goals and even companies. A lot of companies are reporting um, on how their businesses support or contribute towards achieving these goals. Um, a nice example of how Marvel Douglas has recently invested um, in a in an SDG aligned financial instrument is a social impact bond that we just bought into. Um, the bond targets low cost housing for women in specific income brackets, um, and this would link to contributions or impact um, SDGs, including SDG one, which is no poverty, SDG five, uh, gender equality, six, clean water and sanitation and 11 being sustainable cities and, and communities. Another example could be our investments in renewable. Um, my colleague Pran uh, will share a great example of a, a, a company that was previously um, fossil fuel, a fossil fuel based energy company that transitioned into a renewable energy uh, company, which supports um, the SDG 13, which is climate action. And then this slide um, I thought was just a, a really great schematic that's taken from the publication in search of impact uh, measuring uh, the full value of social capital. Uh, the publication was compiled by the University of Cambridge and the Investment Leaders Group. On the left side, there are 10 interconnected steps uh, from a, a framework called Rewiring the Economy. And what these steps do is that they provide a guideline in terms of what business, government, and finance um, needs to do to build a sustainable economy. And for, uh, for finance, for example, the steps speak to how investors of capital can demand more for their money, um, using their influence to drive long-term environmental and socially useful value creation in, in the economy. And then on the right, we see examples of investment themes related to SDGs. And this follows the same structure where we have our targeted impact themes uh, that are associated with the, the relevant um, SDGs. Um, for example, you'll see there's basic needs and basic needs um, as a theme uh, speaks to issues such as food, water, energy, shelter, uh, san sanitation, communication, um, communications, etc. And then another example would be uh, resource efficiency, which looks at how you produce, uh, preserve stocks of natural resources through efficient and circular uh, use. So that's how we, 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 that's the direction that we've taken in terms of looking at our impacts and measuring our impacts against the SDGs. Um, I just really like this diagram. I think it's a great way to visually represent how everything is linked and, and all works towards building uh, sustainable economies. And then lastly, as part of our ESG strategy, um, we're aiming to become a uni the uh, United Nations uh, Principles for Responsible Investment Signatories, uh, UNPRI. And uh, what you're seeing um, on the screen now are the signatory commitments, which speak to how Melville Douglas will be reporting on how we integrate ESG in our investment processes. Um, it will also show you how we seek to, you know, how, how we would look to disclose how our how our entities sorry would disclose how they also look at ESG issues and also overall just supporting and propagating responsible investment. Uh, we believe that becoming signatories would not only be um, a guide for us in terms of implementing a robust and effective ESG strategy, but um, it will also be a signal to our clients that we take ESG seriously. And becoming signatories also reaffirms our credibilities as investors. So we really see this as a license to operate and becoming signatories to UNPRI uh, really helps us to develop an ambitious roadmap for you know, continuous improvements um, with, with, with clear, I suppose, signposts or long-term objectives. 
And that is the end of my presentation, but we will be going to a short poll before my colleague um, Pran takes over to take us through some investment examples or case studies um, where um, ESG has played a, a, a critical um, role. Thanks. Okay, so far we have 3% at no, it's just greenwashing. 79% okay, it's gone up to 80 now. It's an important contributor, and 17% in the sort of middle space of um, I'm not sure we need to learn more about it. But I think let's give it a a minute go and get the final score. But good to know that the, the majority of the room feels that it's an important contributor. Okay, I think. Yeah, let's, let's leave it at that, um, at the 3%, 81%, and 16% respectively. Thank you for taking the scores and, uh, sorry, to making votes. I uh, will hand over to my colleague, uh, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Mbali, and good morning to our listeners, and, and thank you for joining us for our presentation today. Um, as Susan mentioned, I am Prandana, and I co-manage the Marvel Douglas Global Equity Fund. And so really, you know, tying up this presentation and bringing it to life uh, and excited to be sharing with you um, examples of three great investments that we currently hold within the Global Equity Fund that we feel, you know, who have business models that are aligned um, to trying to address some of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, but also make sense from a financial returns perspective. Mbali has taken us through you know, how we at Marvel Douglas already incorporate a lot of ESG considerations into our bottom-up um, investment process. And what's important for us is to really track the rate of change that we see um, in these companies and their progress that they make towards achieving their own sustainability goals. The rate of change is important to us, um, and we place much more focus on that as opposed to a, a perfect company or a company starting off with a perfect store score, um, because it's very subjective, and you know there's not many companies out there that that are that do fit into that bucket. When we think about impact investing, however, it's almost one step further in that their business models. Um, have either been repurposed or repositioned or were set up from the start um, so that they are actively tackling some of the world's greatest challenges. So whether it be environmental challenges or societal challenges, um, these business models are perfectly aligned and have been um, purposefully set up in a way so that they can address issues like, like climate, um, climate challenge, uh, like climate challenges. Um, so I think what's also important from you know fund manager perspective and when we identify um, really good investments for our clients, they have to make sense both financially and in terms of having a measurable positive um, net impact um, to the greater to greater society and the environment. And so most of the companies um, that do have quite high um, you know, or quite strong ESG principles embedded in their underlying business model, they tend to also deliver superior returns and they deliver more sustainable returns just by the nature of their operations. Um, but they also do make sense, you know, from in terms of positively contributing um, to tackling some of these challenges. And so today we'll be sharing three examples, as I mentioned. The first company I'd like to share, um, uh, share with you is a company called Ersted. So they're a Danish, um, they're, well, they're now a Danish uh, pure play renewable energy company that focuses predominantly on offshore wind. And I say now because the company actually started off as an oil and natural gas company. Um, but by purposeful um, you know, and deliberate action that the management team have taken, they've they were able to pivot their business away from traditional sort of fossil fuels towards green energy, towards renewable energy. Um, and again, this was purposeful, this was deliberate um, by the management team and by their shareholders um, as they wanted to positively contribute to tackling some of the environmental challenges um, that we're facing currently. We're going to play a short video just to give you a little bit more color and insight into what Earthstead did, what Earthstead does. Imagine you were asked to change the way we power the world. Mm. 
it might seem a bit overwhelming at first until you remember even the biggest changes happen one small step at a time. One gear, one bolt, one circuit at a time. One click, one test, one advancement at a time. One machine, one better machine. One bigger, better machine at a time. One person, one team, one small step at a time. From the world's first offshore wind farm to its biggest, we've been working to create a world that runs entirely on green energy. Because little by little, big happens. Ersted, love your home. As we can see from the video, and it's quite an inspiring video, one small step at a time, little by little, the company has been able to completely um, pivot and, and reposition their business model, um, you know, to tackle some of the issues that they feel quite strongly about. Over the 2006 to 2019 period, Ersted was able to reduce their carbon emissions by 86%. Um, and again, this was this was purposeful in in management and shareholders wanting to redirect um, redirect the operating model. But of course, you know, we mentioned that these companies that we invest in also have to look attractive from a from a financial perspective and generate uh, strong returns for our shareholders. And why do we feel that this is the, this is going to continue to be the case going forward? Well, there's two structural growth drivers that will continue to favor inv favor investments behind Orsted. The first is a natural shift away from using fossil fuels towards cleaner, you know, more greener energy sources. So governments are pushing and driving this change. Corporates themselves are looking to, to, to use cleaner sources of energy. And even ourselves as individuals and consumers, we're also quite conscious um, of reducing our own carbon footprint um, and looking at alternative sources such as solar panels. And so there's a natural transition and a natural interest and desire to move towards renewable sources of energy. The second important driver, and Mbali touched on it earlier, is the regulatory landscape that's becoming increasingly supportive of directing more capital um, towards companies that are contributing positively to some of these sustainability goals. And so it's not only been regulation in developed markets, but also in key emerging markets where there's a, a strong push and a strong focus um, to reduce carbon emissions and to tackle climate challenges. And so we feel these two um, headwinds are going to be, sorry, tailwinds are going to be supportive of growth for the company going forward and therefore allow Austria to deliver um, consistent and superior returns for shareholders um, over the future while still having a, a net positive impact um, on the environment uh, that they operate in. The next company I want to chat about is HDFC. So HDFC is, is a lesser known company, but it's actually India's largest privately owned bank that was founded in 1994. It's predominantly a retail bank with more than 70% of its revenues being derived from lending. So basic lending to both individuals, but also uh, businesses and, and small and medium enterprises. The, or the, the business model and their initiatives really aim to contribute to driving um, social and economic development within India. On this basis, we feel that you know, this business model is best aligned to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals number one, which is for no poverty, and number eight, which is for decent work and economic growth. So how does a bank such as HDFC contribute to, to, to economic growth and to social development? So the UN estimates that by 2027, the Indian population is going to overtake that of China. 
But the important differentiator here between these two powerhouses is that while a lot of China's growth was dependent on exports, um, India's growth is going to be dependent on domestic consumption. And that's really underpinned by more people entering the working, um, the, the working class, so more people entering, getting jobs, um, you know, the working population increasing, but also a strong urbanization of the world's largest rural population that have a strong history and culture embedded in, in entrepreneurship. And so the chart on the right hand side shows that India has a lot to catch up, both relative to its developed market peers, but also some of its emerging market peers. What the chart shows is India's total credit as a percentage of its GDP. And so in terms of scope for, you know, for, for the Indian consumer to become more financially literate and to increase financial inclusion and really just educating the consumer and businesses around the benefits of having a bank account. And one of those benefits is access to credit, access to lending. And of course, you know, it needs to be done in a, um, in a responsible manner and in a way in which the bank appropriately prices, uh, prices risk um, without sort of, uh, you know, resulting in too many bad debts and non-performing loans. And so what HGFC has have demonstrated in the past is their ability to lend responsibly. And by lending responsibly, they really are enabling individuals and businesses to continue to grow, to continue to flourish, to continue to, you know, send their children um, to, to, to schools and universities, to build their homes, um, to really have a better quality life. And in the case of small businesses, you know, providing them access to credit that will allow them to grow, that then that will in turn allow them to employ more people. And overall, you know, the snowball effect of just helping drive economic growth. What HDFC have done is that they're very conservative in their lending practices. And so they've been very responsible in terms of ensuring they appropriately price for the risk. And they don't lend in a reckless way. And that's important because, you know, as we all know, reckless lending can have very negative impacts um, on society as a whole. This, from a financial aspect, um, you know, this conservatism in, in the management team in terms of how the bank is run um, and, and, you know, they focus on high quality assets has allowed them to generate superior profits, which translates into earnings. Uh, combined with their strict and tight control over costs and they focus on becoming more of a digital bank um, as opposed to, you know, as opposed to being a traditional um, a bank with tons of branch rollout. So they focus on cost control combined with their uh, disciplined and, and good lending practices has allowed them to generate consistent returns for shareholders. And therefore, we feel, you know, HDFC is really well positioned and, and really a key enabler to drive and to contribute towards the economic and social development um, of the of India um, and the Indian economy. Moving on to the last company that I'd like to share with you. So Ecolab are really the, you know, they, they find solutions to the world's biggest challenges. And whether that be water, hygiene, food safety, and health, um, they really work closely with their customers. Uh, they've got global customers, they've got global reach, in a vast, um, a vast array of different end industries. Um, and they work closely with these customers to help them uh, consume more responsibly. So consume natural resources such as water more responsibly, um, to place food safety and, and hygiene standards, um, you know, taking that, placing at the top of the priority list, taking that more seriously, um, and to also do their bit to help their customers reduce their carbon emissions. So to give you an example of how how Ecolab works closely with their customers, um, you know, think about the travel and leisure sector as well as the QSR space. Um, some of Ecolab's key customers would be franchises like the McDonald's stores or even like your hotel chains, Hilton, Marriott, etc. Ecolab will sit down with a McDonald's store as an example, a McDonald's restaurant, and look at how the business can save on water usage save on electricity consumption. Um, of course, that's beneficial for McDonald's because it will bring down their operating costs, but then they will also step in and advise on how they can improve food, staf food safety um, and focus on hygiene standards, not only in the back of the kitchen where the food is being prepared, but also now and, you know, particularly after COVID, um, you know, focus on the front of the shop, you know, are the, are the, is the environment clean enough and is it continuously being, um, being clean so that your customers and your your guests feel safe to eat within your restaurant space. So there's a natural 
desire from, from customers to work closely with Ecolab, uh, number one, to consume natural resources more, more responsibly, um, to place food safety and hygiene, uh, you know, front and top of mind, but also to drive down costs, um, you know, throughout this process and to optimize from that perspective. What Ecolab are also doing, as many other companies are doing, not only helping their you know, their clients or their partners to save on this, they also have their own initiatives and goals, um, you know, and, and that, that are committed to, to improving their own operations. So whether that be to achieve a positive net water impact, to prioritize safety of their staff, or to really support and drive an, a diverse and inclusive workforce. So everyone is doing sort of their bit to, to contribute to tackling some of the world's biggest challenges. In fact, Ecolab are working really closely with their customers um, and they want to save 300 billion gallons of water each year by 2030. And this is equivalent to the annual drinking water needs of 1 billion people. And so everybody is, is really keen and has vested interest to do their own bit, um, not only from the fact that, you know, it can reduce costs, but also because they are doing their part in helping uh, tackle some of the challenges that we face. Based on this, we feel that, you know, it's best aligned to, to the UN Sustainable Development Goal number six, which is for clean water and, sanit and sanitation. With that, I hope to have demonstrated a few examples that we do hold within the Global Equity Fund that we feel, you know, not only drive strong financial returns for our clients um, in a responsible and consistent manner, but are also, you know, also have business models that are, are having a net positive impact in tackling some of these challenges. I think what I also wanted to get across that, you know, specifically with the case with Orsted, it's not to say that they had a perfect score at the start. Um, they were they were a fossil fuel company, you know, they were energy and natural gas, but by deliberate and purposeful action, they were able to pivot their business model um, so, so, so that they could help tackle some of these challenges. And so I mentioned rate of change at the start. That's exactly how we, how we look for investments and how we track management teams in terms of their progress that they're making towards addressing some of these issues. Um, with that, I'd like to stop and hand over back to Susan to do the Q&A. Great. Thanks so much, Prindana and Mbali. That was really interesting. We have had a couple of questions coming through in the Q&A and the comments box, and I also had a couple of questions on my own. Um, the first question I'm actually going to address to Prindana, and it's something that comes up quite a lot um, apropos of ESG investments, and it basically is, you know, are they too expensive? You know, have they already done everything they're going to do? And I think if you look at the example of Orsted, it had a fantastic 2020, up around about 80%. And I think 2019 goes up about 58%. Um, so it, it, it's easy to see how people think that these shares have already done too much and they're too expensive. Um, what would you say to that, from Donna? Thanks, Susan. And, and it, it is very uh, topical question at this point in time, especially if you look, you know, over the past two years, how, how well a lot of these ESG funds have done or, or ESG investments have done. Um, I think that is a fair comment. I can't deny that, um, you know, they have re-rated quite a bit and some of them are looking very expensive. I think we need to take a step back, though, and understand why ca so much capital um, has has flown into the, this part of the sector or this part of the investment universe. So if you think about certain industries, um, and Mbali touched on it earlier, um, you know, specifically within the European countries, a lot of pension funds or institutional funds um, have mandates that prevent them. So they do negative screening and they prevent them from investing in certain sectors. So maybe it's thermal coal, or maybe it's tobacco or alcohol, alcoholic beverages, arms and defense, etc. So these industries are naturally uh, net losers. You know, there are, is capital that is flowing out of these investments just by the fact that a lot of these funds are mandated not to invest in them. Um, so these, you know, so these certain industries will likely trade at a structural discount going forward, just given the fact that there's less capital that is flowing into them. The converse or the opposite is true for ESG funds and ESG investments, where capital is, incremental capital is chasing and being invested behind um, companies that are seen to have, uh, you know, have business models that have a positive impact on, on tackling some of these challenges. 
Um, and you would expect them to trade at, for these reasons at a slight premium to some of their counterparts. Um, there was recent research that was published that you know demonstrated that these companies that adopt higher um, high standards of ESG principles um, in terms of their operations, they actually have been able to generate faster profits, but more importantly, they do so in a sustainable manner relative to some of their other counterparts. And I think that is really you know the reasoning as to why they trade at, at elevated premiums. Um, of course, at Marvel Douglas, you know, we're very disciplined in terms of valuations and prices that we pay. And so we, we're guarded against overpaying for some of these investments, especially after the incredible run that they've had in the past two, you know, two to three years. Um, but it doesn't mean we don't look at them. You know, we'll find a valuation and a level that we're comfortable paying and getting in at. Um, and if something's too expensive, we'll sort of patiently wait before we make a start in these investments. But I think structurally, given that they generate higher returns and that they're, um, you know, they're more sustainable uh, in generating that, they should trade at a premium. Great. Thanks, Pondana. I think um, it's, it's also, I think in South Africa, we haven't really seen anything re-rating from an ESG perspective, apart from the things where the money has left. And I think probably the two um, big examples that a lot of investors would be familiar with would be Sassel and British American Tobacco. So you can really see what happens when that marginal investor leaves and um, that actually those companies get a bit cheaper. And I think one of the, the things that I would just caution as a red flag is that sometimes they look cheap, but they could also be a value trap if you don't have the catalyst. And, and talking about catalysts, um, I think one of the ones that we'd like to discuss a bit is Sassel. Um, one of the questions we've had is saying, what proportion of the Melville Douglas um, investment un investments are already ESG compliant? Um, and I'm going to hand this over to Mbali because I think he needs to explain how, you know, it really isn't, um, ESG isn't just a sort of single score. Often it's something about a journey and a transition, the way that Orsted has transitioned. Um, so, Mbali, could you perhaps um, take us through that answer? So, oh, thanks, Susan. And you're absolutely right. Um, we we obviously take into account, like you're saying, that score. Um, but it, because there's so many elements to consider, um, we we're mindful of that. So, whether it be the score in terms of the performance of the organisation or a certain number in terms of our overall portfolio. Um, you're quite right in saying that ESG is an evolving process, and I would hate for us to be caught in, you know, a, a, a certain number to say the company, a company has to have this percentage for us to say, great, we'll move forward with them, or for us to say, this is the percentage in our portfolio that we want to target into in terms of ESG, because then we find ourselves maybe potentially pushing things down a path that they wouldn't naturally um, so I think to have a, an organic growth and to really consider things appropriately, um, my view is exactly that, to look at things um, holistically and not be, you know, really focused on just the quantitative aspects, but also look at the qualitative, like you're saying. Um, I think uh, Cecil is a great example um, that you've mentioned. Um, for me, you know, it's someone might ask, well, Cecil isn't really doing great in terms of ESG, but if you look at their transition plans, um, then maybe that's something that I would consider to say, okay, maybe are we comfortable in the way that they want to transition in the future? And it speaks to, um, you know, the Orsted that Prandana was explaining again, um, that it's not necessarily that number, but also a story of transitioning and getting, whether it be, you know, a single company or our portfolio to get to a certain number. Um, so that's really how I view it. Thanks. Great, thanks, Mbali. And I think also always important to remember that if you're not a shareholder, you actually can't influence companies' behaviour. So shareholders, as shareholders, we can vote our proxies, but there is also a danger that all of the dirty companies get sort of pushed into the private market. And once they're private companies, then it's very hard for investors to influence them. Um, another question for Mbali comes from Bradley, and he's asking, how do you verify the ESG scores of the company? Sure. So um, I did mention in the presentation that we have an external um, service provider that provides with those res uh, with those reports. So what they do is they will take information that relates to the performance of the company 
And um, in developing the strategy, one of the things that um, I'm focusing on in making is making sure that um, we align what our eligibility criteria, for example, would be against international best practice standards. Uh, so we are looking at things such as the UE taxonomy. Um, in South Africa right now, National Treasury is looking at developing a green taxonomy. So for me, those are the, the tools that we will use to make sure that, um, you know, um, in financial instruments or, or, or investments really are um, held up or, or compared to accredible standards. Great. Thanks, Mbali. Um, Jan and Richard both touched on the area of um, corruption and corporate malfeasance. So again, I think a lot of South African um, investors were um, hurt by businesses like Steinhoff um, and Tongot. More, so Tongot were cooking their books and um, Steinhoff, um, really a lot of it did um, settle on the board and, the, and the, the governance issues around the board. So Marcus used to control that board. They were all his friends and colleagues and there was no independence on that board. And I, I mean, I think that's one of the principal um, learning points to take out of the Steinhoff um, debacle. But I think the question in Bali that came through is what, are there any things that would be such red flags from a governance perspective that we would, uh, Melville Douglas would be forced to sell the shares? Um, yes, Susan, I mean, you, you yourself have just given some great examples, and I suppose this speaks to um, the governance side of things and the proxy voting that I spoke about earlier. So, for example, if we found that there was an issue in terms of, you know, board members, like you mentioned, in the governance structures that we weren't comfortable with, we have a right to, to vote um, um, in line with those issues that we've identified um, as shareholders. So, if, for example, we vote towards a certain um, direction in terms of issues that we've identified, in this case being governance, and if we feel that, um, you know, the right decision hasn't been made or a company isn't making the appropriate progress for us to feel that, you know, they are taking appropriate action to remedy whatever it is that we've raised, then I, I think it's quite right, rightly that we could, um, you know, um, remove ourselves or exit that clients. Great, thanks. But I guess that the point is as well is that you will always talk to the company and if they're, if they're unresponsive, then, then, then you can sell. Um, so Natalie raises the issue about sort of looking for new um, investments that, that tick the ESG boxes. And unfortunately, I think as South African investors, we're all too aware that we've really seen a paucity of new and interesting businesses and growth opportunities there. Um, but Prandana has got some experience of this in the offshore um, funds. So Pran, maybe talk us through how you go about valuing some of these early stage investments, because I guess they're often not profitable at, right at the beginning. Yes, so, so absolutely. I mean, a lot of these companies are still investing for growth. They're innovating. They're spending on R&D. Um, you know, they're investing in CapEx, which is exactly what you ex expect an early stage company to do. Um, but that means that they're not, you know, they're not showing um, positive earnings growth, um, you know, um, up, up front. And if you if you cast your mind back, you know, uh, 10, 15, maybe even 20 years ago, Amazon was in exactly the same space. Um, so the two things, you know, we have to incorporate sort of non-traditional um, valuation methods. Um, so traditional valuation methods would be looking at uh, profitability, looking at cash flows, um, you know, looking at, at ROE, which is your return on investment. Um, but to incorporate some of these non-traditional me me uh, valuation methods, you would really need to take a longer time horizon. So on average, and as, as long-term investors at Marvel Douglas, we generally use a five-year time horizon when we, when we sort of value most of our companies. For these early stage companies, um, we're using a 10 year time horizon. And that's really, um, you know, just given that they are early stage and you have to sort of uh, give these companies the, the opportunity to invest, to build their, their moats, um, you know, to, to, to develop high barriers to entry that will then allow them to generate consistent, um, you know, incredible earnings and cash flow in the future. So the first thing is being patient and having a longer time horizon when, uh, when assessing or evaluating some of these investments. Um, the other thing to consider is that because they're not 
um, making or, or generating positive earnings at this point in time, you really are taking a view on the visibility um, on the potential for earnings growth. And in order to take a view on that, you have to have fairly high conviction around the addressable market. So do you think the outlook for the, you know, for this industry or for this certain this part of the sector is attractive? Um, are there is there a growing desire that would be supportive of consumers or governments or co companies, you know, using the services or using the products in the sector? Um, and therefore, do you think that this end market will be credit credible from the total addressable market size? And more importantly, do you have high conviction that this company that you're evaluating will actually come out strong? So are they the first mover advantage? Or like I said, are they investing quite aggressively and heavily up front so that they are able to build quite a credible moat and to build you know, high barriers to entry that will then allow them to deliver superior earnings growth? So we do have to incorporate some non-traditional factors into the valuation method, but I think the most important one is having um, you know, fairly high conviction around the end market and that this company um, will come out as the winner, as the incumbent, uh, but also just taking a longer time frame in terms of realizing that investment return. Great. Thanks, Prindana. That was an excellent answer. And I think it actually covers one of the questions that had come up from Clem, where he's sort of asking about how you get the return. And I guess that one issue is that the return is over a longer period of time, perhaps, than you, you would typically expect. Um, and I also think um, I had another client the other day who said to me, but, you know, hasn't this green energy thing done? And I said to her, well, I think the thing is that in five to ten years' time, we're not going to be talking about Allstead as a green energy company. We're going to be calling it an energy company. And a lot of these new technologies that we're investing in now are actually going to be the mainstream technologies in five to ten years' time, and I guess we have to hope they will be um, if we want to plan it for our children and grandchildren to grow up in. Um, so just to, to just to sort of re reiterate, I think that the the that the ESG um, strategy and framework that Mbali has outlined fits absolutely perfectly with what Melville Douglas has always said its investment philosophy is, um, and that is to provide superior um, risk adjusted returns. Um, we are long term investors, so the sustainability is really, really um, important for us. And I think the framework that Mbali has provided really gives some rigor to, to how we assess those risks going forward. And it certainly feels to me um, after the last two years that, you know, the world is perhaps a riskier place than it used to be. Um, I think we are coming up to the end of our time now. Um, perhaps. I'll just go over to you in Bali and Prindana and ask if you have any closing remarks. Um, no, just to say thank you for a great session. Thank you for facilitating, Susan. Um, and thank you to everybody that participated. I hope that it was insightful and, and useful for you all. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for listening and also very excited to share some of the ideas that we have within our fund. Um, and, you know, for those investors, just reach out to your portfolio manager. We'll be able to provide uh, more, more information if, if, if there's anything you're looking for. And thank, thanks for your time. Great. Thanks, Prindana. Um, so I think just my closing shot is that um, obviously we're talking about responsible investing. Um, so that's something we are already involved in. But everybody has to do their own bit here. So whether it's at home or whether when you go into the shop, please try and do everything you can just to recycle um, and buy things that are greener and reduce your, your, your footprint on the earth. Thanks very much. And hopefully we'll enjoy the rest of your day and enjoy the rest of your August. And hopefully next August, we'll be able to see you in person. Thanks very much.